I am Howard Berman, the uh, Executive Director of the Society for Classical Reform Judaism, which is co-sponsoring today the events of the next three days as a Founders Day conference that will help us to continue to reflect from a variety of perspectives on the themes that were uh, that were raised during the Founders Day service today and that have been part of the now three-year partnership between the Society and HUCJIR here on the Cincinnati campus. This is actually our third annual Society for Classical Reform Judaism Institute here on the Cincinnati campus, part of a partnership whereby the society has envisioned the demonstrating of our support for our current generation of rabbinical students who are going to be our future leaders. We have wanted to share our vision of a renewed classical reform voice within the broad diversity of today's reform movement. The society was founded five years ago to be a national voice of advocacy for both the preservation and the creative renewal of our shared reform Jewish heritage, its distinctive liturgical minhag, its great musical repertoire, not as a historic relic, not as a nostalgia piece, but as a dynamic and vital option for the contemporary reform movement, as a voice within all the richness of today's URJ family, with the broad variety of worship styles and approaches to Jewish tradition that make our reform movement the vital, dynamic, liberal religious community that we are. The society's commitment is to preserve and renew the beloved shared traditions that have enabled us to be wherever we are on the reform spectrum today. We don't see ourselves as a historical society. We see ourselves as those who are committed to the continuing development of the classical reform tradition as a vital, dynamic expression that is an option for the contemporary reform movement. We feel that we have a voice to proclaim. We feel that we are not at odds, that some of the dichotomies that Rabbi Sussman spoke about earlier today are the very internal divisions that we are trying to heal by renewing classical reform, not as a historical chapter, but as something that has evolved, something that transcends aesthetics and style, an expression of reform Judaism that is at home as much with Lewandowski on a pipe organ as with Debbie Friedman on an electric guitar and everything in between. But we also know that in the midst of all that diversity, the great liturgy, the rigorously, vigorously liberal spiritual ideals that gave strength and prophetic vision to reform Judaism in the past still have a contemporary message and still can play a very vital role in today's American and world Jewish community. Part of our vision is our partnership with the Israeli reform movement, 
through our annual institute at HUC in Jerusalem, which will begin three weeks from now uh, with a broad variety of programs, union prayer book services in Jerusalem, which last year filled the HUC chapel with Israelis who came to hear the great music and experience this distinctive minhag in the midst of all the diverse expressions of our tradition available in Israel today. And so today's program that we inaugurate now, a dialogue entitled The Wises, Einhorned and Beyond, will, over the next three days, explore the legacy of our founders, the visions of both Isaac Mayer Wise, of Stephen Samuel Wise, and of David Einhorn, who, as you left the chapel today, you might have seen the small plaque in the back of the Scheuer Chapel that pays tribute to David Einhorn as the father of classical Reform Judaism. We in the society revere the legacy of both streams of our shared tradition. We have a special place in our heart for the radical vision of David Einhorn, which among other things was not only the spiritual mentor who created distinctive reform liturgy in a direct line of descent through the Union Prayer Book and Mishkan to fill it today. But Einhorn also being the pioneer of the social justice commitment of our movement. And we have brought together a variety of the faculty and leadership of our college institute and our movement to share different perspectives on these personalities and related issues today, tonight, and tomorrow. We're going to begin today with our Rosh Yeshiva, the president of HUCJIR, sharing with us his personal perspective on the wise legacy. Tonight, Rabbi Lance Sussman, who just spoke to us at Founders Day, will share his perspectives on the Einhorn legacy. It's significant and incredibly symbolic that they are the two direct successors to those two great pioneers. Rabbi Sussman, successor to David Einhorn in Philadelphia, and Rabbi Ellenson, successor to Rabbi Wise, both Rabbi Wises from HUC. So they are in unique positions to share not only the legacy, but remember the focus of this conference is beyond, reclaiming and renewing our shared heritage for the 21st century. So we will not only be reflecting on history, but I hope together we will be able to reflect on how the courage, the vision, the creativity of our founders can continue to be a rich and inspirational resource for our ongoing spiritual journey today in Reform Judaism. We hope you'll take our materials that are out in the hall, our current um, journal issue of the Reform Advocate, one of our CDs with um, contemporary and historic reform music from our revision of the Union Prayer Book, the contemporary gender inclusive version of the Sinai Union Prayer Book that we have offered to the broader movement to experience the beauty of our liturgical heritage. We hope that um, in the course of your time with us today, hopefully again tonight, and through our programs tomorrow, that we'll all have an opportunity to encounter and engage with the heritage that we all share, regardless of the labels, 
that we may use to describe our point on the rich and diverse spectrum of Reform Judaism today. So with that, I'm going to ask Rabbi Dr. Ellenson to share his perspective on Isaac and Stephen and their message for us. difficult part of the lecture. You're supposed to take one of these and just pass it on to someone else. Uh, this is taken from Wise. And then each of you should have one of these pages. Howard, how do you want, given that we're a half hour to 40 minutes late, how do you want to 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40, just let me know. 30. Okay, great. And whatever, it's more important that you share what you want to. And okay, you engage terrific. In do I need to sit here or can I get up? You can do whatever you want. I just want. didn't know. But there's a mic on or, uh, so I can't just walk out in front, I should stay here because of the recording. Of, yeah, that would be okay, so I'll stay here. Okay, fine. Saharaim Tovim, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone has the uh, sources. I've used this principally, the sources that are being passed out now, as in a sense props. But they're props that are meant to say to you that what you probably think classical reform Judaism is, in other words, I think I think, in a popular sense, most of us have in mind the Union Prayer Book um, and other things that flow from it. Part of what I hope that we'll be able to do today, in precisely the spirit that Rabbi Berman spoke before, is that the broadness, I would say, of what our classical reform heritage is, is much greater than what I suspect many of us assume, but we can also have a discussion on that, uh, on that later. In any event, I am very, very grateful, Howard, for the invitation to come and speak today about the legacy of Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, Rabbi David Einhorn, and Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, uh, the founders really not only of this college institute, but of our, uh, of our reform movement. And I'm always very mindful of the power of their heritage uh, and the ways in which we should look at that. And what I'd like to do for the bulk of my comments is to focus principally on Rabbi Isaac Mayer Weiss and David Einhorn, probably spend a little bit less time here in large measure because um, our time has already become contracted uh, in terms of what we had initially uh, mentioned, and perhaps tonight when Rabbi Sussman and I, with uh, our rabbinic colleague from Indianapolis, discuss where we stand today, we'll have another chance to speak a bit more broadly about what the meaning of all of this is for us today. I think that what I'd like to do this afternoon would be to simply uh, talk a bit about the ways in which I view someone like Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, Rabbi David Einhorn, and use their prayer books to illustrate this so that you can get a sense of what the heritage is that we have in fact received from our, uh, from our forebears. Uh, and I will make, Howard, some personal comments about my own feelings, namely, if I can quote the Aramaic, my nafkamine, what is it, my yotsemi calls it, what, what is it I would learn from this material and what is it I think 
uh, are the lessons that we have to derive from it uh, today. Uh, so let me talk then very briefly, and I will also admit that it is uh, humbling to speak about this topic with Rabbi Sussman here. Uh, he is really an expert in 19th century American Jewish history. Uh, I presume he'll be tolerant of whatever my errors are uh, that will emerge in my presentation. Uh, but I have the same problem that any student has when they speak before their teacher or an expert in the area, namely, did I get that really right? So if I look to you, Lance, from time to time, you'll have an understanding of that. And of course, with my colleague, Rabbi Rick Saracen, uh, really a tremendously great expert in Jewish liturgy, uh, I'm quite well aware of the uh, learned nature of the audience today. And of course, all of you who are lay people and rabbinic colleagues, your knowledge as well. In any event, I'll try to do, uh, do what I can. Uh, when we talk about the legacy of classical reform Judaism in North America, and particularly the works of Isaac Mayer Wise and David Einhorn, it is important to keep in mind that there are predecessors to each of these men. There was an article published many, many years ago in the 1970s by our teacher, Rabbi Jacob Petachowski. Uh, it was a Leo Beck Institute lecture. And it was entitled, Geiger and Holdheim, Their Impact in Germany and Their Influence in America. And basically, the point that Professor Petachowski made is that the position that Abraham Geiger popularly known as the founder of the reform movement held in Germany, his position, as opposed to that of his reform opponent, Samuel Holdheim, that their influence in Germany was great, but that Geiger's instantiation in North America became Isaac Mayer Wise, and David Einhorn occupied the role that Samuel Holdheim occupied in Germany as a much more radical reformer. That is to say, Abraham Geiger, from an ideological standpoint, and I think in light of Lance's uh, address to us today and in light of Howard's remarks right here, what I would note is that while there were certainly differences in style and approach to ritual that Rabbi Geiger took, as opposed to Rabbi Holdheim. And similarly in America, Rabbi uh, Wise, as opposed to Rabbi Einhorn. Ideologically, they were actually much closer than one might suspect. And I think that is something that we should examine as we move through the next three days. That is to say, while there will be ritual differences that will emerge, and even policy differences that emerge, the reality is that part of what I want to also show you today is that these people, for all of their differences and internal squabbles, actually shared a common ideological posture. And I'm going to try to make that clear uh, in my remarks to you this afternoon. Abraham Geiger, of course, was a preeminent scholar of Judaism uh, in the 19th century. He lived from 1810 to 1874. Rabbi Geiger is what we would call, in traditional Talmudic parlance, he was an eshkol, ish shehakol bo. That is to say, there is nothing in classical Jewish tradition that Abraham Geiger did not know. One reason I believe, and Michael Meyer is not here right now, that no genuine biography of Abraham Geiger has ever been written, I do not believe anybody knows enough to write a biography about him. He wrote on Judaism and Islam. He wrote on medieval Parshanut, medieval Jewish commentary. He wrote historical, philosophical works. There is virtually no one in the history of the reform movement, with the possible exception of Kaufman Kohler, who knew what Abraham Geiger knew. His knowledge was prodigious. Geiger was a reform Jew. He believed in the notion of the historical development of Jewish religious tradition. He took ideologically extreme stances on many issues, but we know, for example, he observed Kashrut his whole life. We have lots of letters. When he would travel, he would go to great lengths to make sure that he would always have kosher food. He railed against circumcision as a barbaric rite. 
and when his own boy was eight days old, had him circumcised in a Brit Milah ceremony. Uh, was it Emerson? Foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. He had a rather large mind, Abraham Geiger. Interestingly, Geiger would not serve, and now you have to keep in mind the German model, and this I think is somewhat significant for us in our deliberations here. Geiger would not serve in a German situation a separatist reform congregation. In Germany, unlike America, there was not a congregational model. There was a community model, a Gemeinde or a Kehillah. In Germany, all Jews paid taxes to the Kahila, to the Gemeinde, to the overarching community. The community would then appoint a reform rabbi, an orthodox rabbi, but the funds were paid by a central communal body. If you wanted a separate reform congregation that had no commitment to the general community whatsoever, in Germany you had to pay voluntaristically separate funds to support that community. Geiger, in principle, would not serve such congregations. He believed that reform always had to be an integral part of the community. He wrote two Sidurim when he was the rabbi in Breslau, one in 1854. This Sidur was much more traditional than he was. That is to say, he compromised in all sorts of ways because he thought it was worthwhile to keep the entire community together. By 1870, and he's moved to Berlin, and he's no longer serving as a congregational rabbi, he writes a much more radical reform prayer book in 1870 than in 1854. But his entire career, he would not serve an Austritz Gemeinde. He would not serve a separatist, reform congregation. In contrast, Samuel Holdheim, uh, who lived only from uh, 1808 to 1858, Holdheim, unlike Geiger, did not even learn to speak German until he was 30. He was raised in a uh, very, very traditional Jewish background, as was Geiger. He became the rabbi of the Reform Congregation in Berlin, which was a separatist reform temple. They had initially invited Geiger to be their rabbi. Geiger refused to do that. Holtheim became that rabbi. In this congregation, the main service was moved to Sunday. He did remove his yarmulke during prayer, which made him unique among all German rabbis. He favored rabbinic officiation at intermarriage. By the way, it was against the law in Germany to do this, so it was a completely theoretical posture on his part. Uh, he would not blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. Instead, he had a uh, trumpet that he used in lieu of the shofar. He introduced a lot of radical, radical reforms. His major disciple, ultimately in America, ideologically, came to be David Einhorn. Wise preceded Einhorn to this country. Isaac Mayer Wise, uh, of course, came from Germany, arrived in America in 1846 at the age of uh, 27. And again, I'll have Rabbi Sussman correct me if I'm wrong here. It's not 100% clear he was an ordained rabbi. Uh, he said he was a rabbi. He certainly knew a great, great deal. Our institution derives from him. I just want to say to the students, if you look like a rabbi to some degree, you act like a rabbi, you serve as a rabbi, you're a rabbi. But it is absolutely not clear that he ever actually received semicha. But we'll uh, bracket that for a moment. In contrast, David Einhorn was a genuine Talmud Chacham. He, he had real semicha, he was extremely learned, but he was politically extremely radical. He had been arrested in the revolutions of 1848. He ultimately came to the United States as well. He was a majority of one. One thing I will say about David Einhorn, um, he did not need your approval in order to take a stance 
on a given kind of issue. Part of what I am attempting to say here at this point is that Wise, as opposed to Einhorn, Einhorn had a much more sectarian kind of personality. There would be no other way to describe it than that. Wise came to the United States. He initially served, of course, in Albany, New York. I had the privilege uh, last Shabbat to be in Albany at Rabbi Scott Spien's congregation. They celebrated Beth Emmet, their 175th anniversary. All of you, of course, know the very famous story that on Rosh Hashanah in 1850, he went to the Ark. The president of the congregation came up, engaged in a fist fight with Rabbi Wise, and the congregation split at that moment. Again, I know you're glad you came here today. The rabbi and the president actually had an argument. And not everyone agreed in the congregation about what Judaism should or ought to have been. One of the reasons he was attacked is he was a reformer. Why? When asked a question in public, do you believe in the coming of a personal messiah? He said, no. I believe in a messianic era. On the other hand, he established a rule that no one could serve on the board of the congregation who kept their business open on Shabbat. Anyone who kept their business open on Shabbat could not possibly be a leader of the community. So part of what I want you to see is that while Wise had a reform penchant ideologically, he had a vision of historical Judaism that had, for Rabbi Wise, very absolute kinds of standards. I may give another couple of examples of that later. Wise thought early on, after he came to Cincinnati, that what needed to be done if American Judaism was to thrive with virtually no organizations, that there needed to be a seminary that would educate rabbis so that American Judaism would have the type of leadership that it needed in order to thrive. He came to Cincinnati. He tried to create a rabbinical school, the Zion Collegiate Institute. It failed completely. And this will be my only time making this kind of comment today. Because if you have a rabbinical school, what is it you need? <laughs> what do you need if you want to have a rabbinical school? Money. Money. That was very good. Very, very good. I don't know why. The students want scholarships. This building, I don't know, the city of Cincinnati, the Ohio Electric Company wants to get paid. The library books cost money. And I look to Rick and Neely. I don't know. Faculty want to get paid as well. We won't even talk about the president. Uh, <laughs> it cost money. He had no money, and he had no support, and he failed miserably. Part of what I admire about Isaac Mayer Wise is not that he succeeded at everything he attempted but he learned from every failure. He decided, I need to go about this in a different way. He then established a newspaper, the American Israelite, or De Deborah, which became the leading, in many ways, newspaper in 19th century America. There were others as well, Isaac Leeser, but Wise became very prominent, known throughout the country. He also created a prayer book, and I'm going to pass this around, the Minhag America. This is a reform prayer book written by Isaac Mayer Weiss. It is completely in Hebrew. He wrote three versions of this. One is all in Hebrew. One is Hebrew with German translation. The other is Hebrew with English translation. This became among major congregations in North America the single most popular Sidur. The single most popular Sidur. It made Isaac Mayer Wise a major figure in every community in the United States. This Sidur, he understood his audience. He had a homogeneous German-Jewish population here. Remember, in 1815, there were only about 3,000 Jews living in North America, 1,500 of Sephardic descent, 1,500 of Ashkenazic descent. Between 1815 and 1881, 225,000 Jews came here. They were all German-speaking. This is not going to be insignificant for lessons we should learn. It was a culturally homogeneous community where the German Jews outnumbered the Native American Jews from the colonial and early Federalist period by over 80 to 1 by over 80 to 1. It was a much, much different period in American Jewish history. Wise dreamed of uniting these Jews, and he understood who they were. He called a conference of all the rabbis in North America in 1855 in Cleveland. 
How many rabbis attended? Seven rabbis. By the way, if you're ever on Jewish Jeopardy and the question comes up, Abraham Rice, you can say who was the first ordained rabbi to come to North America. Abraham Rice came to Baltimore in 1840. There were not a lot of rabbis here. There were none during the Federalist period uh, or during the colonial period. And I would say to all of you lay people who are here, it was the worst time in American Jewish history without rabbinic <laughs> leadership. Uh, that I say in a completely objective kind of fashion uh, without the rabbinate. He signed, at that time with his seven colleagues, a platform that asserted, in effect, I'm not quoting it exactly, everything in Judaism has to be done in accord with the Talmud and rabbinic law. Fourteen years later, he was in Philadelphia at a conference called by David Einhorn, that in effect, and I am not stating this exactly the way Rabbi Einhorn wrote it, but it amounts to the Talmud is outmoded and it is really not the final yardstick as to how we make decisions as Jews, and he signed that as well. I, I have many comments I could make about this, but I would say that Rabbi Wise displayed great flexibility in the ideological positions that he took. Since Rabbi Berman mentioned this, and I will talk about what it is I think we really learned from Rabbi Einhorn, when asked about the question of slavery, and I presume Gary Zola will talk on this in, a, in an hour, what was Rabbi Wise's position on slavery? Isaac Mayer Wise, the great founder of our reform movement. Right. What? States' rights completely kosher. The Bible permits slavery. There is no problem with slavery whatsoever. That was a position that Isaac Mayer Wise took. In contrast, let's turn to David Einhorn. In a moment, I'll turn to these Cedar Reed to illustrate certain points. Einhorn, as I said before, was a majority of one. He came and served in Baltimore, Maryland. And there, every week, preaching in German. And I should have added this, Wise was an American. He spoke in English, he did do some speaking in German because of the nature of his population, but he embraced America from the very beginning. Einhorn only spoke in German. His belief, by the way, was that the spirit of Reform Judaism could only be captured in the German language. And I'll talk about what that means with his prayer book in a moment. He got up every week and he delivered, in effect, a pro-abolitionist anti-slavery speech. Ultimately, what year was it, Lance? 1860, 59? When, when he had to leave. Uh, he had to leave in 62. 62. He gets up in April of 1862 in his pulpit. His board came to him and, in effect, said, during this time of the war between the states, when Maryland was still a slave state, remember, Cincinnati was part of the Union, but very sympathetic to the Southern cause. Wise did not rock the boat in regard to slavery. Einhorn got up in April of that year and said, my board has come to me in effect, and they have said that this is problematic, the stances that I have been taking. And he said, I must not have explained myself well, and gave, and I should really have brought this, one of the most fervent anti-slavery pro-abolitionist speeches ever delivered. My mother used to always tell me, and I do think this is true, if you stand for your principles, people will respect you. But it does not mean they will give you a job. Uh, he had to leave the very next night, and he fled to Knesset, Israel, in Philadelphia, where he served for the remainder of his career. The two men were quite antagonistic towards one another, and in many of the documents of the day, I am just quoting now, Cantor Kaplan, just, this is a quote, Einhorn would often refer to Rabbi Wise, and he would say, as the little chazan from Cincinnati has stated, because it wasn't clear that he had rabbinical ordination, and in turn, and in turn, 
Rabbi Wise would often say about Rabbi Einhorn, as my esteemed colleague, the Reverend Einhorn, has <laughs> pointed out, these barbs that they would exchange reflected, I think, not only personal antagonism, but it reflected something about their stances. In light of the title that Rabbi Berman gave today, part of what I would say is that Rabbi Wise is what I would call a moderate reformer. Very pragmatic and not strongly ideological. I do not mean he had no ideological positions, but I would not call him a strong ideologue. Rabbi Einhorn was a strong ideologue, I think by any standard. And he had a vision of a much more denominationally distinct reform movement than Rabbi Wise did. In fact, Rabbi Wise, if you look at all the institutions he created, the Hebrew Union College, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, he never uses the term reform. When Wise founded this school, he said we're going to educate Orthodox as well as reform rabbinical students. Wise was much more moderate, much more of a pragmatist in his own approach. But one point I do want to make is I would not exaggerate how moderate he was, but I think if we look just for a moment at elements in his prayer book, you'll get a sense of who Rabbi Wise was and what it was that marked him. And in light of Rabbi Berman, Berman's instruction to me today, what it is that I genuinely learned from Wise, and I'll get to Einhorn in a moment. If you look at his prayer book, which became the most popular and influential prayer book in the 1860s and 70s in America, and you looked at it, it opened like a Hebrew book. From the standpoint of symbolism, this looks like a traditional siddur. It does not look like, in quotes, what we would call a classical reform prayer book. Remember the prayer books, and by the way, this is part of the music and other issues with which we are concerned. When one goes to pray, there's what we call manifest and emotive content or symbolic content. The manifest content means the words and what is it they actually say and everything else. Does a person wear a yarmulke, not wear a yarmulke, wear a talus, not wear a talus? Does the book open like a Hebrew book? Does it open like an English or a German book? All of these are part of what I would call the symbolic or emotive content. By the way, for people when they go to services, the emotive content may be infinitely more important for many people than the actual words that are being recited, namely the manifest content. You see the book opens like a Hebrew book. He calls his book the Minhag America, and the very title is a reflection of a moderate classical reform position that we have inherited. What does the word minhag mean? Again, I look to the students. You want me to ordain you, right? Okay, minhag. Tradition. Tradition, custom. Every prayer book throughout Jewish history has been called minhag and then fill it in. It means the minhag Teman, minhag Ashkenaz, minhag Sparad, the Sephardic custom, the Yemenite custom, the German custom. He is asserting that he is part of Jewish religious tradition. He calls his prayer book Minhag. It is an accepted term for hundreds of years in Judaism to describe prayer books. But what does the second word tell you? America. What is the statement that he's making? There's an ideological message that he's giving. What's the message when he calls it what does Minhag America mean then? The what custom? The American custom. This is not a trick question, I promise you. The American custom, namely, if Jews in Yemen and Jews who were Hasidic and Jews who were German had a right to create their visions of Judaism, I too believe that Judaism evolves and changes. I'm going to assert my right to create an American custom. This is an old new prayer book. It is rooted in the past, emotively, symbolically. It is a traditional siddur, or it feels that way. And on the other hand, I am American, and I have a right to do it the way I want. The frontest piece of the prayer book 
is all in Hebrew with no translation. Wise was aware that there were some people in the community who were traditionalists, so he has dinim ashayachim lehilchot tefillah, laws that are connected to the laws of prayer. Everything is in Hebrew, but some of the instructions say, yachol adam lehitpaleo b'chol lashon sheyertzeh. Person can pray in any language they want. You have to, when you recite the Shema, understand its words. If you do not understand Shema Yisrael means hero Israel, you have to recite it in English, German, Polish, whatever your language is. These are traditional warrants that all legitimate change. And it is interesting that Wise went to the trouble of justifying what he was about to do in the prayer book by statements all taken from the Talmudic tradition. It is what I would call, in a pragmatic way, a moderate version of reform. You can then see the index. He even includes a Musaf service. If you go to the second page, take a look over the Hebrew. What do you note that might be surprising? He wants a minyan, but what does he include here? What? Ten adults, male or female, as far as I know, and with Rick, who's a real expert in liturgy, I really do stand to be corrected. This is the first time in Jewish history that women were formally included in a minyan. I mean, it may even be informally. This is a pretty good reflection of a significant kind of change. How would a sectarian Orthodox Jew feel about this? Yes, that's exactly right, your expression. This would make the whole prayer book non-kosher, even if there were no other changes. Part of what I want you to see is that ideologically, he was a reformer. Uh, if you look down at the bottom where it says E2, he takes out the line in this prayer that says, Or Chadash al Tzion Ta'ir, let a new light shine upon Zion. He was completely opposed to Zionism and Jewish nationalism. So he removes anything in the prayer book that smacks of a return or a prayer for return to Zion. In addition, and you'd have to know a lot of Hebrew to catch this, right below at the bottom of page two, thou hast always loved us with infinite love. Ahavara ba ahavtanu. How many of you have heard that prayer? Good, I'm glad all. <laughs> If Tanner Kaplan hadn't heard it, I'd be really worried. And Rabbi Haas, I noticed you didn't raise your hand, but I'm going to assume you learned that in my class or someone else's at uh, the Hebrew Union College. You'll note a couple of lines down where he'll make the point, our ancestors trusted in you. If you look at the next to last paragraph, what does it say in our Siddur that we use even in the reform movement today? We don't say our ancestors who trusted in you, what's the word that's added or that's missing here? We say ba'avur avoteno, for the sake of our ancestors. This embodies a doctrine called zechut avot. Why does God do good things for you? God does good things for you because for the sake of your ancestors. Wise hated this concept hated this concept, and I'll go into it in one moment. In fact, if you turn to page four, look where it says the 18 benedictions. The 18 benedictions, and keep in mind what we just said. Someone want to read the Hebrew here for the 18 benedictions. Baruch Ata Adonai. Okay, just louder, please. Okay, stop one minute. Have any of you ever heard that before? Yeah. Okay, good. Keep going. <laughs> so what does he change there? What word should be there? Vizocher? Chasdeavot. Bezocher chasdeavot means God remembers the loving deeds of your ancestors. Both here and in the Yahava Rabbah prayer, where it says, Ba'avur avotenu, for the sake of our fathers or ancestors, it involves a concept called zechut avot. 
the merit of our ancestors. Wise writes about this. He embodies and evokes in some of his writings the thought of Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant says that a good deed has to be an autonomous one done at the behest of the individual's own moral will. It is lovely that your parents were lovely people. You should remember that and you should honor them. But if I'm going to give merit to you, it is not because of what your father or mother did, it is because of what you do. Why said, I object to the notion of zechut avot, that you should get merit because of what your ancestors did, rather, you today stand in a covenantal tradition and you have an obligation to remember that you autonomously need to fulfill certain deeds in order for merit to be granted you. It, by the way, in light of reform ideology, it actually fascinates me that no one else ever made this change except Isaac Mayer Wise. And the only reason I can give to explain it given classical reform ideology, is that people were so used to the traditional benediction and so committed to the words, v'zocher chasdeya vote, that the change just never occurred. By the way, if you look just a couple of lines up to give you another idea of his op opposition to nationalism, where it says, Sur Yisrael kumab ezrat Yisrael, O rock of Israel, helping Israel. In our prayer books, we have the words, Ufdei chinumecha Yehuda Yisrael, redeem according to your word, Judah and Israel. Why does he take that out? It smacks of Jewish nationalism. He doesn't want to go back to Israel. The key point I am attempting to make here, this looks pretty traditional. I think most of you who are members of the Society for the Classical, of Society of Classical Reform Judaism and who grew up on the Union Prayer Book would not recognize Rabbi Wise's prayer book as a reform prayer book. The point I am attempting to make to you is that on a ritual level, this is a much different prayer book than Einhorn's, but ideologically, he is a reformed Jew. And the last point, and there are a hundred other things I could point to here. Let me point to two more. Go to page six. From a classical reform standpoint, if you think of Judaism in rational categories, and that the words you recite should mean what it is you intend to pray or say, what is wrong with the Kaddish prayer? What is the Kaddish prayer for that we recite at the end of the service? I mean, why, when you get up at the end of the service, as we did this morning, what is the purpose of it? We call it what? The mourner's cottage. But what's the problem with it, then, from the standpoint of manifest content? No content about mourning. There's no content about mourning. It is only praise for God. Hence, if you go back to the origins of the reform movement in 1819 in Hamburg, they add a paragraph. And if you see it here, on page six, right above the line, Rabbi Wise, borrowing from the Hamburg reformers, takes the phrase, Al Yisrael, the Al Sadikaya, the Al Koman, the Itpatar, me Al Mahadein, upon Israel and upon the righteous and upon everyone who has departed this world. Rabbi Wise felt if you're going to have a mourner's prayer, have a word about mourning. This never was recited. Jacob Petachowski pointed that out in regard to Hamburg, and it did not last in America either. Because people were committed to the Kaddish prayer as a mantra. And I don't know how else to say this. The emo well, let me try to say it in academic language. I could say it in others. The commitment to the mantra, the emotive content of the classical Kaddish prayer was resistant to rational discussion and change. Hence, no mention of mourning in this, in this prayer. But Wise, as a reformer, wanted to bring these changes in. Finally, the last point, critical scholarship. Look at his blessings for Hanukkah on page 7. And I could point to others. 
What's the blessing that we recite over the Hanukkah candles? Someone here must know it. Baruch Atah Asher Lahadlik Ner Shel Hanukkah. What does Rabbi Wise write? Baruch Atah Anai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shechayanu V'Kiyamanu V'Higiyanu Lazmana Zeh Lahadlik Ner Shel Hanukkah. Why doesn't he recite the traditional Asher Kiddushanu B'Mitzvotav? Because there's no literal commandment anywhere in the Bible to observe the holiday of Hanukkah or Purim. Consequently, he believes in critical scholarship. He therefore, he thought a prayer book, when you wrote one, should have words that you actually believe in. And if there was a problem with the manifest content, he changed it. His moderate reform in Howard and Lance and others, I think this is worth discussing. What does it mean when you are the leader of a community, you have a strong ideological kind of posture in this regard, but you have to lead an entire community? How do you negotiate your stance and then the stance of a tradition, clearly for Rabbi Wise, maintaining a traditional siddur was very, very important. But I want you to see this is really a reform prayer book, though not the UPB. Now in contrast, and I know our time, we, we didn't get started, Gary, till 2.40, so uh, I'm apologizing to you. I'm, you take all the time. <laughs> Here is an interesting element. This is the prayer book of David Einhorn. David Einhorn's prayer book becomes the Union prayer book. I'll talk about that in a moment. There is almost no Hebrew in it. But I will tell you, you were only going to see it in German. In his lifetime, he would not allow the prayer book to be translated into English because he believed, as I said, Reform could only be expressed in the German language. What? Yes, it had to be. What? Bernard Felsenthal translated it. 1870s, yes. And then we'll talk about what Levy did in 1895. But he fought back. He did not approve it. He did not approve it. I want to be very clear. He was opposed. Now, having said that, First, you need to note what the ideological component of his prayer book is. He calls it the Olat Tamid. Why is that an irony for a man who's a radical reformed Jew? What? Olah refers to what? So what is he saying about his prayer book? He's calling it the eternal, the Olat Tamid, the eternal sacrifice. There's a strong ideological statement here. What is he saying about what is he making the point? What point is he attempting to make by calling his prayer book the Olat Tamid? Yeah, there's, there's, no cult to return to sacrifice. there's no cult to return. You want to know how you pray to God? You do not burn animals. You want to pray to God? You use words. You engage in prayer. He called his prayer book the Olat Tamid, the eternal sacrifice. The book is written virtually completely in German completely in German. The UPB in this sense, the Union Prayer Book was modeled after the Olat Tamid. Yes, but Nadia. I think he's also claiming that he's an authentic inheritor of yes. that tradition. Good. That, it, that, that the spirit of the, of the Olat that he is embodying. Yes, exactly. He's making exactly that uh, that point, that he embodies the essence of the biblical tradition. Judaism has evolved. Now, I want to point out one other point, though, about him. And Lance alluded to elements of this today in his sermon. He believed very, very much in the mission of the Jewish people. And if you look at the two documents that I gave out in the Hebrew, I just wanted, do they both have you all right with them, or is there another one that's these are two elements that he keeps in Hebrew. By the way, I love the beginning of the service today 
with a names me wrote, I will make a confession for whatever it's worth. I grew up in an orthodox background. So every day of my life from the age of, I don't know, seven to 13, I would go to my Orthodox synagogue and my brother or another young boy or me would lead the end of the service. And one of the hymns at the end is this hymn that was sung today, was it Lewandowski's? Uh, Shalit. Whose? Heinrich Shalit. Heinrich Shalit. I did it by an Eastern European Nusach. It's an antiphonal prayer Little boys get up at the end of services in Orthodox shuls to lead this, to prepare them to lead liturgy later on. <laughs> I won't go on. Every rabbi really wants to be a cantor, but that's another uh, issue altogether. If you look at the one where it says page, uh, page 62 and 63, he keeps a ceremony in that in Orthodox congregations is recited on the Musaf, the additional service on holidays. It is when men who are Kohanim, the priest, come up and bless the people. It's a very powerful service. The Shaliach Zibora, the cantor. <laughs> I might as well do a little cantorial work today. We'll call it Kohanim priests. Am Kedoshecha Ka'amur. This is not classical reform. <laughs> and then they'll recite the blessing. Praise thee, O Lord our God. Asher Kiddushan Bikadushato Shel Aharon, who has sanctified us with the holiness of Aaron. And you've commanded us to bless the people Israel in love. And then they do the priestly blessing. The cantor of the Shaliach Sibor will call out, May God bless you. And then the Kohanim, the priest, will repeat it. Only the priest get to bless the people. Duchanan. As Rabbi Sussman said today, Einhorn and classical reform come in and say there is no distinction between Kohanim, Leviim, and Israelites. We are a Mamlechet Kohanim for Goy Kadosh. We are a kingdom of priests and a holy people. This is a great example of ideology being transformed into liturgy. You'll see here he has the Vorbeter, namely who's ever leading the service, and who responds to the Yvarechecha? The choir and the community. The people Israel bless themselves. There is not a priest to bless us. We are all part of a priestly people. You want to see a liturgical expression of classical reform ideology? Here it is. And by the way, in the Ya'alev Yavo prayer on the other page, where we pray, you know, may you lead us up again uh, and remember uh, our ancestors. V'zichron, kol amcha beit Yisrael, Meshichecha. Who is the Messiah? The Jewish people have a messianic task. I love these liturgical changes because in the Hebrew, these are complete expressions of pure reform ideology. The point I would make is that Wise, while his temperament was infinitely more moderate, and the prayer book creations much more pragmatically oriented towards an entire community, and Einhorn, much more sectarian in his reform posture, both of them actually believed in the particular singularity and mission of the Jewish people. You should note, and Rick mentioned it before, there was an English translation of Olatami that he disapproved of during his lifetime. It was done about a year, I think, before he passed away. But his, he had two sons-in-law. One was Kaufman Kohler, and the other was, uh, I was about to say Edward G. Emil Levi, but actually Emil G. Hirsch in Chicago Sinai. Emil G. Hirsch from Chicago Sinai would not accept the Union Prayer Book. 
He would not accept the Union Prayer Book because from an ideological standpoint, it was far too universalistic for him. He, as a disciple of his father-in-law, wanted a more particularistic expression of the notion of chosenness surrounding the Jewish people. So often in courses on liturgy or the history of American reform, the point is made, and it's correct, that Einhorn came to be the father of what we would call American classical reform Judaism. But from an historian's point of view, that should not also obscure the fact that his own literal descendants, people like Emil G. Hirsch, who were the architects in many ways of classical reform in America, had a great deal of problems with the UPB itself because, believe it or not, they did not find it particularistic enough. The last point, then, that I'd really make here is that Wise, I think, ultimately surrendered to Einhorn in effect because once the Eastern European Jews came to America, his vision of a united American Judaism frankly perished. The ideological as well as cultural gaps between Eastern European and German Jews was simply too wide, wide to be bridged. And while you could consider it, the notion of a unified American Israel when the Jewish people were culturally homogeneous of Germanic descent in this country, it was not possible once the Eastern Europeans came. Hence, why surrendered at that point, and ultimately you get the Pittsburgh Platform in 1886, the adoption of the Union Prayer Book in 1895, and the removal of the yarmulke for men in worship comes to be basically a uniform reform custom in the 1880s, 90s, and first decade of the 20th century. Because it's during that period that, again, you have a distinction that will separate German from Eastern European Jews in this country. One point I would make is that what we call classical reform is actually the folk expression on one level of German-American Jews and what came to be conservative Judaism is what I would label the folk expression of Eastern European Jews. The major thing that I learn, and I am actually sorry that we don't have more time, but I hope we maybe tonight, Lance, can talk about this. What I think we learn most significantly from classical reform Judaism of this period is that a commitment to ideology is significant. It does not mean that that ideology cannot find expression in diverse ways. But part of what both Rabbi Einhorn and Rabbi Wise did share, for all the greater moderation of Wise, and I would acknowledge that, they also had ideological commitments. And since Rabbi Sussman mentioned our teacher and our curmudgeon, Rabbi Arnold Jacob Wolf, uh, Alava Shalom, he was a unique character. He once spoke at the Los Angeles School of HUC when I was a student. And I'll say that he caricatured the Pittsburgh platform in a much more scatological way than he did in 1999. And I actually went up to him afterwards, and I think those of you who know me, I'm not the most confrontational person in the world, but I found actually his categorization of it, frankly, offensive. And I don't get offended that easily, usually. Uh, the Pittsburgh platform is really the embodiment of a quite a noble vision of Jewish religious tradition. I would correct it, add to it with the vision of a Rabbi Stephen Wise, who had a strong Jewish nationalist position. But to say that Judaism is a religion that wants to be allied with progress, that it is universal in its orientation, that it is committed to social justice, I find all of those things actually quite praiseworthy. Uh, and these are elements of our tradition that we need to honor, and they need to find expression. Now I'm looking to the students in your rabbinical or cantorial callings uh, today. So I think there is a great deal that we have to learn from this. I hope that what I have done, I do not intend today to confuse anyone, but I will say this, one of the great advantages of not knowing much about anything, or knowing just a little bit, 
is that reality or the facts do not have to confuse your opinions. And so I suspect for many of you, what you think classical reform is or was, is based, I think as Lance put it, on what the Union Prayer Book was. I mean, I will say one of my aunts is from Mobile, Alabama. From 1975 on, every time she saw me, my Aunt Bernice, after Gates of Prayer was adopted, her opening words to me every time she saw me, what have you rabbis done to my union prayer book. The issue of whether the Torah came from Mount Sinai is not a question that concerned her a great deal because she knew only one book came from Sinai and that was the, UP, uh, the UPB. Uh, there is a great deal uh, more that I could say. I want to thank again Howard and the Society for having this conference. I hope that what I've been able to do in just talking about Rabbi Wise and Rabbi Einhorn and just looking at a couple of pages from their prayer books and placing them in context is that you appreciate the divisions that separated them, but that you also come to see what their enduring legacy is and that you yourselves have an understanding that this heritage of classical reform is actually much broader than you might suppose that it was. And therefore, it is more than worthy of study, and I would even say guidance for those of us who are still striving to create the, uh, to create the integration of the old and new with which Rabbi Wise struggled when he created the Minhag America. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, impinge on Rabbi Zola. He actually knows about his topic. Uh, but really, comments, questions. Yeah, Lance. Oh, footnotes. Sure. Um, the business of women and men. Um, when um, Wise had the fist fight with President Louis Veneer in Albany, uh, he knew he was without a job for the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So he, he and his followers bought a church. The church included family pews. Yes. So men and women sat together. And talk about practical reform. Uh, that's why men and women sit together in reform. It's not that they had a big ideological debate. In Germany, men and women sat separately. Like Except, Martin, in the Berlin reform. In Except in Berlin, yeah. yes. And almost nobody reacted to it here uh, in, in America that they had put them together. Although, just to add a footnote to Rabbi Sussman's footnote, Keep in mind, this then became an American custom so that the conservative movement, its mark of separation from orthodoxy was uh, mixed seating. Right. At one point, orthodox had men seating, women seating, and mixed seating. Right. They had three zones in conservative. On uh, a uh, vote, in Turkey, a vote, um, Brita vote, it seems to me, also has an anti-missionary element. Oh. Right? in the sense that it's not just the deeds of our fathers, but it's the covenant. covenant. They were under constant assault from Christian missionaries. And by saying grief of vote, it actually strengthens the theological position that it's not just that how our people acted, we can still be good people and Jews, but that we still have a, a brief, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean, do keep in mind, and I don't want to make this overly academic, we'll keep citing, these will be dueling footnotes and sources. Wise, in many of his writings, does talk over and over again about the centrality of the concept of covenant in Judaism. And in fact, in an issue of Shema magazine that's going to appear, I guess, in the next month, uh, there's a dialogue where I actually had the zechut, the privilege, of interviewing my teacher, Dr. Eugene Borowitz. And I actually asked Dr. Borowitz if his own emphasis on covenant theology was in any way influenced by Rabbi Wise. I thought this would be really fascinating. And then, of course, from every academic standpoint, you're hoping for a chirush, a new insight. Um, he told me no. He didn't even know that Rabbi Wise had made the change. Lance, last thing, and then we'll move on. Okay. All right. The product of a single rabbi Bye. Who, who acted unilaterally. When the rest of the rabbis saw it, they yeah. said, you, you can't use it. So 
Then UPB 2 came out, and that was the committee's work. And then a UPB 1A came out, and that had the Einhornian influence. So when we talk about Union Prayer Book today, it was not the original Union Prayer Book. It was the second edition, which is the base text for the, and that is Einhornian. Right. Uh, perhaps you all have a uh, tell me your tell me your name, and uh, from Atlanta. Okay, good. The temple. Everyone knows that. <laughs> oh, Rabbi Wolf's. He used a term that's less polite than crap to describe it. Oh, what was his point? He felt that it was. Uh, completely universalistic in its orientation, that it had no appreciation for Jewish particularity, that it was anti-ritualistic uh, completely, and that it denuded Judaism of any particularistic elements that would distinguish Jews from any other religious tradition or from secularists in the world. I mean, in a sentence, that was his, uh, that was his critique. Uh, I think, by the way, he completely decontextualizes uh, the Pittsburgh platform. By the way, the Pittsburgh platform, as all of you know, was principally written by Einhorn's son-in-law, Kaufman Kohler. Uh, Kohler is an interesting figure. He came from a very orthodox background. He lived for two years with Samson Raphael Hirsch, the orthodox rabbi. And in fact, in his inauguration address at HUC, he has about four pages devoted to Samson Raphael Hirsch. Uh, and the influence that Hirsch had upon him. I'll only say that Rabbi Hirsch did not later claim him as, uh, <laughs> as his student. Uh, he moved very, very far from, uh, from the childhood that he had. But uh, from an historian's point of view, one interesting fact is that uh, both Heinrich Gretz, the great historian of the 19th century who taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary in Breslau and Kaufman Kohler actually lived with Samson Raphael Hirsch. They had both read his book, The 19 Letters. They both grew up in extremely orthodox backgrounds. And in their journey from, I'd call it yeshiva-ish orthodoxy, to uh, liberal expressions of Judaism, they passed through Samson Raphael Hirsch's home. I mean, they actually lived with him for a couple of years. The only story I know akin to that, uh, there was a justice of the Israeli Supreme Court and a great, great scholar named Chaim Cohen, uh, who also grew up in a very, very orthodox background, studied with a great scholar named Rav Cook. Uh, and there are memoirs of Rav Cook's that there were people in the yeshiva who wanted to expel Chaim Cohen from the yeshiva. Rav Cook said, no, no, let him stay. He's the smartest boy I've got in the yeshiva. He ended up a Supreme Court justice in Israel and a great scholar of Jewish law. And ultimately, uh, his grandson found his way to the reform movement and serves as the dean of the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati today. So we have many such stories of people who obey the rabbinic dictum, ma'alin bakodesh va'ein moridin, one only goes up in holiness and never declines, so that a number of our people started in orthodox backgrounds and end up as reform rabbis teaching at the Hebrew Union College. Uh, any last questions or comments? Yeah, Howard. Just, um, one really delicious irony that you pointed out, maybe even unwittingly, David, that um, <coughs> G. Hirsch, David Einhorn's son-in-law, never adopted the Union Prayer Book. In 1892, <coughs> published the English translation of Einhorn's Alat Hamid, which became the prayer book yes. of Hirsch's congregation, my longtime pulpit, Chicago Sinai Congregation, which did not adopt the Union Prayer Book until 1961, was using Einhorn until 1961, then adopted the Union Prayer Book, and today is the champion yes. of the preservation of the Union Prayer Book <laughs> through the Sinai edition of the Union Prayer Book. So a lot of these incredible ironies of how these traditions get expressed and developed 
really quite No, it's a terrific story. I mean, one of the things I will say just from an aesthetic standpoint, these men knew so much Jewishly. I, I mean, I don't know if you all can appreciate it. His emendation, Einhorn's, to the Ya'alev Yavo prayer and the, uh, the way in which he invoked Duchanan to express his theological positions. This is what happens when you do what people like Gary Zola, Lance Sussman, Rick Saris, and Jonathan Cohen and I do too long. I, I can't even begin to describe the aesthetic pleasure that at least I, I honestly receive when I, when I come across a document like this. I just think this guy was a genius. He's working with the tradition. He has a different ideological posture. And he weds himself to the tradition even as he, in quotes, betrays it. It is what I would call a creative betrayal of the tradition. Because it moves the tradition. It, it completely changes the manifest content. But it builds in a beautiful, beautiful way upon it. These are all interesting <coughs> figures. The last point I would make about the two of them as was mentioned, by the way, Einhorn's, I guess it would be his great-grandson, was Edward G. Levi, who was uh, president of the University of Chicago and the attorney general under President Nixon, also dean of the Chicago Law School. Wise, as you all know, had 14 children. He really was the father of reform. <laughs> he was the father of American Judaism. <laughs> but his youngest daughter from his first wife, with whom he had eight, married a newspaper publisher. Wise did not have a great deal of respect for him. I'm sure Gary could speak of this at great, great length. We have descriptions. His son-in-law edited a newspaper. Wise did not think very much of journalists. Son-in-law was from Tennessee, Chattanooga, and he had a newspaper called the Chattanooga Times. His name was Adolph Oaks. We have stories that when Wise's daughter married Adolph Oaks, he came as if he were the king of Siam and treated everyone kind of accordingly. He performed the wedding. Later on, his son-in-law moved from Chattanooga to New York, created another newspaper called the New York Times. Uh, and it's part of the reason why there are some connections between the Salzburger Oaks family. And in the 1920s, and with this, I really will conclude, he raised, he attempted to raise in 1926 to 28, five million dollars to support the Hebrew Union College. He only ended up getting 4.6 million because the depression came. But letters that I love, Oakes writes to Julius Rosenwald in Chicago and said, I'd like you to make the lead gift of 500,000. Rosenwald writes back to Oakes and says, what are you talking about? How much are you giving? He said, well, I'm giving 100. Now, uh, that was when 100 was a real gift. Uh, Rosenwald writes back and says, forget it. You're as rich as I am. If, you can, if I can do 500, you can do 500. So the two of them together, they got over $2.5 million for the college in a year. And that is really what kept the Hebrew Union College alive during the Depression. And I say this to the faculty here, because in the early 30s with the Depression, Mum dues went. <laughs> this is something I'm quite aware of. Uh, <laughs> college's budget in 1929, 340,000, 1935, 190. The union's contribution went from $200,000 in 1928-29 to zero. But Rosenwald allowed his 500,000 to be used to sustain the college during that period. And the only other group, and I say this to some of the women here in particular, that really supported the college during this period, the women of Reform Judaism. Any of you members? Uh, I'm grateful, is all I can say. It's a wonderful story, and Gary has induced me to uh, participate in it. Howard, thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it very much.